Good morning, everyone. We're asking the question, where is God in the sermon series? And uh, welcome to Easter at Harvest Ridge. Um, we're glad you're here. Glad you all got up. Y'all looking so good. I see people wearing their like Easter best, wearing like suits and stuff. And I walked past one guy. I said, what is this? I've never seen you in anything other than a t-shirt. But welcome to Easter Sunday where we put the Ritz on to have a little fun. How about that, right? Speaking of which, Easter, what is Easter? There were three guys that died. They were uh, casual Christians, and, and uh, they, they were real casual church attenders. So one day they're, uh, they're driving, uh, and they have a car accident. All three of them died, and they showed up at the pearly gates. And when they got there, St. Peter says, uh, he says, all right, you can enter the pearly gates if you can answer one simple question. And the question is, what is Easter. And the one gentleman says, oh, that's easy. It's the holiday in November when everyone gets together, eats turkey, and we're thankful. <laughs> Reject, go. All right, Peter says, wrong. And then he looks at the second guy and says, hopefully you can do better. The guy says, oh, yeah, I know what Easter is. It's that holiday in December when we put up a nice tree, we exchange presents, and we uh, celebrate the birth of Jesus. And St. Peter shakes his head and says, no, leave, go. So finally, the third guy, he says, I know exactly what Easter is. He says, uh, St. Peter looks at him and says, oh, yeah, yeah, prove it. So the guy says, Easter is that Christian holiday that Coincides, coincides with the Jewish celebration of Passover. Jesus and his disciples were eating at the Last Supper, and Jesus was later deceived and turned over to the Romans by one of his disciples. The Romans took him and crucified him. He was stabbed in the side and was made to wear a crown of thorns, and he was hung on a cross with nails to his hands and feet. He was buried in a nearby cave, which was sealed off by a large boulder. And St. Peter's like, yes. And then the guy continues. And every year the boulders moved aside so that when Jesus comes out, if he sees a shadow, we know whether we'll have six more weeks of winter. <laughs> I want to talk to you about the purpose of Easter today, but before we get there, we're in a sermon series called Where is God? It's entitled Where is God? And last week, uh, we asked a question from the book of Job, where was God and Job's suffering? And we're in the process, we're going to take this story of where is God from about five or six different uh, uh, directions. And today I want to take it from a little bit different direction. This series, uh, when we talked about Job, we asked the question, where is God when we feel like God is absent? Um, and last week we learned from Job that pain causes us to act and think unreasonably. Isn't that the truth? Pain causes us at times to act and think unreasonably. Anybody ever acted unreasonably when you were in pain? Yeah, all right. Second of all, uh, good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. That's a lesson we learned from Job, that sometimes good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. And then the third lesson was God doesn't always answer our questions, but his presence is life-giving. And I guess that's the, the whole point of this whole sermon series, if we were to boil it down really simply. You see, I was on vacation, and I met this couple, and we began a conversation with them in that conversation. We, uh, we were talking, and the guy said that I had lost both of his, they had lost both of their children. And I'm like, what does that mean? And then a little later, I asked his wife to explain, and him to explain, and, and what happened was their 32-year-old daughter had died from a non-hereditary lung disease. And then just a, a short time later, their 18-year-old son, returning from a missions trip, died of the same non-hereditary lung disease. And we're standing there talking to this couple, and, and we realized they had boss, lost both of their children to disease, and they were, they'd buried their children. And now they're adults, and they're like, oh my, now what? And, and uh, we found out they were from a Christian background, and they were even Assembly of God, which is our parent fellowship. And I, as I'm talking to them, I realize there are a lot of people probably in this church today that you're dealing with a struggle of where was God when I was going through my pain? And that tell, makes me think of a story. When I, was, um, when I was 15 years old, I was hurrying home uh, from a football weightlifting to get home so I could turn around and go to a senior high, I was 14, sorry, uh, to a senior high football game. I was in the, the eighth grade, riding home on my bike really, really fast. And I was going to go to a football game that night, ninth grade, I think it was. Anyway, I'm riding, and uh, I, my foot slips off the pedal, 
and I hit the tar and chip road. Now, I don't know if you know what tar and chip is, but they take tar, they throw it on a road, and then chip means little bitty minuscule gravels. And I hit that gravel doing about 25 mile an hour because I was hurrying home. And when I did, I got up and looked down and my knee was missing. It was, it was a huge cut and all my skin was gone. Part of my tendons were chewed away. All kinds of things were gone. I looked down, part of my elbow here was gone. There was a huge hole here. And uh, I remember limping home, but I wasn't very far from home. I, I limped through the door and I said, hey, mom and dad, uh, I think you want to come out here. They were apparently in the bathroom or something. I don't know. We were getting ready to go to the football game and I was hurrying home. And, uh, and dad walked around the corner and said, I'll go get the car. So what happened was later that night when I went, they had to make a clean wound out of that wound. And as they sliced away all the dead flesh and they pulled the bone, the flesh together from here to here was pulled together. And I had 64 stitches in my knee. Now, let me just tell you that when they give you 64 stitches, they start and then it takes a long time to get done. And by the time they had finished cleaning up the wound and stitching, all of the pain deadener was gone. So the last couple of stitches, I could feel everything. Here's the worst part. I don't know why, but in Fort Smith, I have bad things happen. But they, they didn't give me a nurse, so it was my mom literally holding the skin together while the doctor is sewing me up. In that moment, in that moment, listen, listen. In that moment, I needed some stitches. But do you know what the most comforting moment of that was? I know this sounds weird, that my mom was holding the wound. That was the most comforting. Most comforting was my dad was sitting there saying, suck it up, boy. <laughs> Those were the most comforting moments to me. Now, now, put that against, I went to a hospital one time, and there was a little girl there, and she was going through a procedure, and she had no one in the room. And the sobbing of that little girl wasn't so much for the pain as it was for the fact that she was all alone. What I want to say about suffering, if you don't understand it, before I get into the message, if you don't understand it, let me just simply say this. The greatest thing God gives you is that he's there with you. No matter what you're going through, Jesus is still there. So that being said, let's jump into our text today. Our text is um, from Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet if you would, please. Uh, this is our text for the entire sermon series, actually. And uh, it says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice and he said, uh, you, I should make y'all read this with me, but I'm not going to. Eli, Eli, lama sabathani. That's Aramaic. And what it means is, can y'all say this with me? Everybody together, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this is the word that Jesus mentioned from the cross. And today on Easter Sunday, I want to talk about this word, these words, and where they came from. Can we do that? All right. Father, I pray that today that you would speak to hearts. If I can talk someone into something, then somebody else can talk them out of it. But if your Holy Spirit speaks to human hearts, then God, there is nothing that can't be done. There is no mountain that cannot be covered over. There's no space or hurt that you can't heal. There's no restoration you can't do. Everything is possible for you. So today we ask that you would speak to us through these words and you would reveal your truth to our heart. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. All right. So I want to give you the top 10 reasons I believe in the resurrection. Top 10 reasons I believe in the resurrection. Number one reason I believe in the resurrection, if you might want to write these down a little later on, I'm going to give you all 10 of them. We're going to start with number one here. It is foretold in the Old Testament hundreds of years before that Jesus would die, that he would be buried, and he would be resurrected. 
So hundreds of years before the event of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it is foretold in exact detail. As a matter of fact, our text today, our text today, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is from a very famous psalm. And that psalm is Psalm 22. So we're going to go walk through Psalm 22 today. So we're going to spend our time in the scriptures is the root of of this passage, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, comes from Jesus was literally quoting a psalm. So let's look at the five prophecies. There are five prophecies in Psalm 22 that are fulfilled literally in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Can we look at them? Number one, identification. Now, when Jesus is on the cross, he uses his words to say, that's what he says. It was probably more like, la, 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 samah. Why would he do that? Why would he take his energy and his breath to do that? The reason is two reasons. Number one, identification. He wants us to know that he is identifying with all of us in our pain in that moment when we feel like God may have forgotten or forsaken us. So identification is number one. He is calling attention to this psalm. He is calling attention all the way back to Psalm 22 and identifying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. And and there are people that have taken these words of Jesus on the cross and they've made them into a theology that is not appropriate. Why? All right, so if I wanted you to know something was important, And maybe I wanted to toss out a line to you that you would all understand, right? Uh, Let me see. I pledge allegiance. All right, so stop right there. What happened? I used three words. I pledge allegiance. And everybody in the room knew the rest of what I was saying. Am I correct? Is that correct? All right, so what's going on when Jesus quotes this verse from the cross? He is not only talking about identification that he knows how we feel. I believe he is also calling attention to the fact that the fulfillment of Psalm 22 is happening in this moment. So he is calling attention to this very moment. So the good news of the gospel is that Jesus, our God, was not content to stay distant and to judge us, but he came and was one of us. He chose to suffer and empathize with us through this identification. And he quotes this text as a way of saying that. Now, Hebrews 4.15 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have a high priest who understands us. So the very first thing Jesus was doing by using this words is he was saying, I'm fulfilling God being with you in your pain. Now, I'm a little older now. And, and yeah, don't laugh. I'm a little older now. I'm no longer, I went somewhere from being too young to be a pastor to being too old to be a pastor. And I'm not sure what day that happened, but somehow I went from being too young to being too old. And, and now I work out, I work out with a group of guys and we're all getting a little older, all of us. So, you know, this is how we start our, our workouts. Yeah, this is hurting today, and Dan's got to rub his stuff on his arm to make his arm not hurt. And I'm stretching, and I look over, and Dan, the other Dan's, like doing shoulder exercises because he's had surgery on his shoulder and stretching out. And I'm watching these guys operate. We are the walking wounded about to exercise. (laughs) And our first 15 minutes of our conversation is about all the pains we've had this past week, right? I understand old people now. Nursing home conversation. Yeah, I don't have my teeth. Yeah, I can't see anything. Yeah, but I still got my license. No, I'm just, I'm just. (laughs) I, I went there. I'm sorry. So my point in all of this is that Jesus, when he showed up and on that day on the cross, he identified with all of us in our weakness and our sin and our pain and our sorrow. He identified with us by becoming sin for us, by taking on our weaknesses, by sharing in our grief and sorrow. So that's number one prophecy. Number two prophecy is the mocking crowds. This prophecy is that his death will be incredibly public. Now, we'll come back to crucifixion in just a second. But I learned something about crucifixion I did not know before. I used to think from all the pictures I had that they put them up really high on a cross. But they did not put them up really high on a cross. Their feet were only about that far off the ground. 
So Jesus' feet was only about that far from the ground. You know why? Because they wanted, listen, crucifixion was a cruel way that the Romans used to, to keep the people in fear so they wouldn't mess with them. You mess with us, this is what happens to you. So they would crucify people on major roads. So Jesus is literally hung on a major road with a sign saying that he's the king of the Jews. This is what happens if you try to be a king against us. And he was hanging there at eye level so that when, and by the way, I know they always wore loincloths in your version, but Jesus wasn't wearing the loincloth. He was totally naked. And he was hanging at eye level, and he was like this, about this much higher than normal, so that everybody walking down the road would look at him in the eye and see the grief and the suffering and the pain in his face. It was a way of telling you, don't mess with us. Now, that being said, the prophecy in the scripture is that there would be this mocking crowd, there would be this shame moment, that crucifixion is intended for shame. Psalm 22, 6 says, But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him, deliver him, since he delights in him. Now, Jesus, Jesus actually said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that people would remember these words about the mocking. Because what was going on at the foot of the cross that moment in Matthew 27 is, those who passed by, what did they do? Come on. They were hurling what? Insults at him. And they were shaking their heads and saying, you saved others. <laughs> you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. You got all this power. You saved others. You can't save yourself. If you're the son of God, then come down from the cross. Do you hear the mocking tone? Now, this is a direct fulfillment of what was prophesied all the way back in Psalm 22. Jesus carried a three, think about what Jesus did that day. He carried a 350 pound cross. Now, I have one time in my life squatted 365 pounds, and I'm gonna tell you that 365 pounds is not sissy weight. Anybody ever squat that much? That's a lot of weight. That's a lot of weight. And you put it on your back, you're like, oh, I don't think I can get up. My knees are doing this. Jesus carried a 350-pound cross 650 yards down the Via Della Rosa. And all the while, do you know what they did? The whole step, they spit on him. People would throw dung on him off the streets. They yelled at him and cursed him and said, yeah, you Mr. Spiritual, you made lepers walk. Why don't you take care of this? And Jesus is prophesying from the cross. He is calling to mind the prophecy that said people would mock him. The third prophecy fulfilled is that of crucifixion. All right. Psalm 22 was written all the way back about 1,000 A.D. by a man named David. It is universally agreed upon. I, I read some commentaries and stuff, and just about everybody agrees David wrote this song. 1,000 A.D. Do you know that crucifixion as a form of capital punishment was not made up until the Persians did it sometime around 300 A.D.? So 700 years before crucifixion was invented, it is prophesied, in detail. I'm going to prove that to you. Let's look through the text. Psalm 22, verse 14. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. It's hard to read that. All my bones are out of joint, but that's what it says. We'll come back to that. It says, my heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's hurt. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. Notice this. They pierce my hands and feet. They pierce my hands and feet. And then all my bones are on display and people stare and gloat over me. Now, let's talk very, very quickly here about crucifixion. What is crucifixion? Jesus, let's back up. The Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was up all night long. He had sweated great drops of blood. He had been arrested, summarily been arrested. He had been taken into the courtyard where he was beaten. His beard was plucked out. They spit in his face. They punched him. They beat him. They put a crown of thorns on him. Uh, they then Pilate ordered his flogging. And the flogging that they ordered was a flogging that they just stopped right before you died. 
So they beat him until literally his skin was ripped off. That's what the beating happened. Your skin would literally be ripped off of your back and your belly from the cat of nine tails because they would attach pieces of rock and stone in it and, and bone in it and, and it would rip your flesh off. So literally Jesus' flesh was ripped away from his back and his sides so that his bones were visible. And then they took him and they nailed him in his hands and his feet. They nailed him to a cross. Now, after all this blood loss, and remember, it's hot in Jerusalem. It's the dry sea. It's hot in Jerusalem. And he's hanging on a cross for hours. And so much so that one point he cries out, I thirst. I thirst. Because anybody, right, anybody ever play sports? And you like go at it hard all day long and you hadn't had anything to drink and you're like going, going, going like two a days in Oklahoma and you go really hard playing football. We were out running. They would run. We would do our sprints and run and do our sprints. And then when they wouldn't, it was, come on, it was the 80s. It is not the 2000s where we got to have water breaks every two and a half seconds. It was the 80s. And it was 105 degrees and they would send us down to Death Valley to do log rolls until people literally would either puke or pass out. And then they would say, no, that's the way it ought to be, boys. And let me tell you what happens if you do that. You get, come on, what do you get in your legs? Cramps. Anybody ever had cramps? Anybody ever have one of those cramps? You like wake up in the middle of the night and you cramp up and you hopping around the room go, oh, 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 oh. Anybody ever do that, right? All right, so Jesus is suffering from severe dehydration. What happens when you're severely dehydrated? What do you get? Cramps. But you've got to stretch out the cramp to get rid of it. How can you stretch out a cramp if you're hung from a cross? You can't. So what would happen in a crucifixion after the dehydration would settle in, these guys, they would get such severe cramps that literally their bones would pop out of joint because the muscle cramping would pull their bones out of joint. Is this graphic? I don't care. You know what? You know why I don't care? Because some of us, we think, oh, Jesus died on the cross. That's nice. No, Jesus died. He suffered intensely. There are none of you that go through a suffering that Jesus cannot understand it. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, it was all happening to him at the same time. His bones are literally popping out of joint. By the way, that was prophesied in this passage, wasn't it? All my bones are out of joint. So that's what's going on. The cramps are pulling his bones out of joint. His shoulders are dislocated. His Probably his hips and his legs and his knees are all out of joint. And by the way, his bones are on display because the flesh is ripped away. And, and it makes reference to this in here. Not only the crucifixion of my hands and feet, but what happens to the body during crucifixion and it was prophesied a thousand years before Jesus had this happen to him are, are y'all awake yeah. why did he say my God my God why have you forsaken me because he was he was living out Psalm 22 he was literally living it out at this moment number four fourth prophecy they were gambling for his clothes this is very specific, Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. 18. They divide my clothes among them and cast lot for my garment. In John chapter 19, we read this. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one, of them, uh, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. Now, the garment was seamless and woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. So they literally gambled for who got Jesus clothing. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy from Psalm 22 happening in detail. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All the Jewish people standing around went back to, you know, four score and seven years ago. They knew what was being said. Gentlemen, start your engines. They knew what was being said. I pledge allegiance. They knew what was being said and they were watching the fulfillment of Psalm 22 right in front of their eyes. The last thing, Psalm 22, it prophesies the ultimate victory of Jesus. Psalm 22, 24. He's speaking of God has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. Hold on, hold on. Back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. My God, my God, why have you what? 
forsaken me. But yet we find out in this passage, he has not hidden his face from him. This very text tells us that God did not turn away. God did not turn away from Jesus. I know that Jesus was covered with our sins, but the, Carmen said God turned his head. No, God did not turn his head. God looked square on at the death of his son and embraced the suffering like he does with us because he knows that if we will be faithful, God will not uh, despise or scorn the suffering of the afflicted one. So, he has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for mercy. Listen, God hears you when you talk to him. Psalm 22, 30, uh, 29 says, All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. That's sort of interesting. Everybody who dies is going to kneel before this person. What kind of prophecy is that now, huh? All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Do you know that every person who dies will stand before God? There is a judgment coming and we all will stand before the great white throne of God's judgment. We will stand there in honor of him and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It will happen. And there is a prophecy here that even though they're suffering, there will be a moment where everybody will revere the one you know, I preached on Wednesday night, uh, on, on Saturday night, I preached about why did that thief, how could that thief say, my God, my God, or why could he say, remember me when you come into your kingdom? What was he thinking of? Well, maybe Jesus had just said this and that thief is sitting there replaying in his mind Psalm 22 and he realized that Jesus really is the king and that all in the dust will one day kneel before him. And maybe what happened was his heart was turned to God in that moment and he realized that faith sprung up in him from the fulfillment of prophecy and he saw everything being fulfilled and his faith cried out to God. Notice this, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. I wonder if that prophecy is for real. The future generations, what are we doing this morning? 2,000 years after the fact of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, what are we doing this morning? We're talking about it. Future generations will still be told about the Lord. Come on. Somebody ought to shout amen. This is good stuff. All right, so I, I couldn't stop there because this ultimate victory, I had to jump over to Psalm. I think my watch stopped. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 53 says this about Jesus. These are some of the prophecies that are fulfilled. Hundreds of years before the Bible told us, the Old Testament scriptures told us what would happen to Jesus. Isaiah 53, 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Remember Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man, put him in his own tomb, a rich grave. And though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. The prophecy was from the Old Testament. After Jesus dies, he will be resurrected from the dead and he will see the light of life. This is prophesied in detail hundreds of years before it happened. The Bible told us what would happen. The two guys on the Emmaus Road. I've been working through that this past week in Greek and I've been reading it reading it, reading it. And every time I read it, I come across something new. And I realize these guys that were on the Emmaus road, Jesus opened the scriptures to them and said, Hey guys, what had to happen to the Messiah is happening. Here's where it says it in the Bible. And I bet you he was reading Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. And what happened was those guys there, listen, their hearts burned within them because God was talking to them. Listen, I can't make your heart burn. Now, I can give you pizza and send you to sleep, but I can't make your heart burn. And if your heart's burning this morning with the truth of the reality that what happened to Jesus is not some hit or miss accident, but it was God's design purpose from the creation of the world, and a thousand years before it happened, David wrote about in detail how crucifixion would happen later, and the very scene of the cross... God is revealing to you that God has a plan and has always had a plan. Yeah. All right, so that was point number one. We have a top 10 list of reasons I believe in the resurrection. <laughs> Let's go to the other nine. What do you say? 
Actually, we are. We're going to walk through the other nine. I'm just not going to talk about them all. We're just going to be very, very quick, all right? The top 10 reasons I believe in the resurrection, and I believe this isn't a, a made up story. This is not a, this is not a, a myth that got passed along. I believe it's a reality. I'm going to give you my top 10 reasons. Number one is everything that happened to Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection was prophesied hundreds of years before it happened. The second thing is you need to understand that the resurrection stories we have recorded in our Bible are not written as myths. Now, I, have, I literally am a weird person. I have read many of the myths that were passed around, and I know there are other people who say, well, there's other re resurrection stories in antiquity. Have you ever read them? You should read them sometime. They read like the guy, Romulus, or whatever his name was, he got lost in the woods, and the wolves came, and they raised him, and he suckled at the, bre at the, the, the chest of the, uh, of the wolves and was raised by the wolves, and they kept him warm and fed him and raised him until he became a god. He was dead, and they brought him to life. That's stupid, right? Do you, I could go on and on and on. They're just stupid stories. I've read them. They're just stupid stories. But this resurrection story that I read is some women went to the tomb. Now, hold on, hold on. Do you know the women had no right to own property? Do you know that women had no say in the court of law? Do you know that women, if you're a woman in this place today and you value your rights, you have Jesus to thank. Let, let's look at other parts of the world where the gospel has not gone. Women are oppressed, but through Jesus, Jesus elevated them. How did he elevate them? Who were the first people who came to the tomb? Women. Why would Jesus, if you were writing a makeup story about Jesus being resurrected from the dead, why would you have women come to the tomb? You wouldn't because nobody's going to believe it. Huh. But do you know why it happened that way? Because it happened that way. What, what are some other things? You know, the time of writings. I, I got in a car, all right? I'm still in number two here. Give me a couple minutes on this because I got eight minutes left, right? All right, give me some time. I got in a car with a guy when we were in Greece and we sat down in the car with this guy and we had just been walking where the apostle Paul was. We were at Corinth and we were at Athens and we saw all the things that were written in the book of Acts. And I'm like talking to this guy about it and he's been talking to me all morning long. And then he, we get, start talking on the way home and I asked him, uh, I said, you know, all the places we visited, they were written about the Bible. He said, yeah, but they weren't written until hundreds of years after the events. And I said, whoa, time out, screech, stop the record. Eh, this is really do you realize that the Apostle Paul wrote in the lifetime of Jesus that there were 500 people, or in the lifetime of those who were, saw Jesus alive, he wrote that there were 500 people that saw Jesus alive because the book of 1 Corinthians was written in A.D. 54. That is 24 years after the events of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And it says, oh, the message of the cross I received back in A.D. 48, I brought to you in A.D. 52, and I now write about it in A.D. 54. It's not hundreds of years after the fact. Jesus, Jesus' resurrection was written about early, early, early. By the way, all of the four Gospels have to be written. I believe they all have to be written before A.D. 70. You know why they have to be written before A.D. 70? Because the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, and the prophecies about that are in the Gospels. And, and why wouldn't they say this elsewhere? You know, it's still standing this day or that to this day or that to this day. Why? I'm sorry, I'm going geek on you. Y'all following me? <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is this. Is these Bible, this Bible, this New Testament we have, wasn't written years and years and years later. It was written within the lifetime of those who saw Jesus alive. So it's not written as myth. It's not written hundreds of years later. It's actually written like a real story, you know? All right, one, one more. Do you know in, in the book of John, John, when he's writing about the resurrection story, says, yeah, I ran, outran Peter to the tomb? Because John has to talk smack against Peter. <laughs> I'm faster than Peter. That's what he said. It's in your Bible. He's talking smack that he's faster than Peter. It is in your Bible. If you're writing a makeup story, why would you include a little detail like that? These are not myth. This isn't a made-up story. It's actually a record of what happened. The third is his followers were skeptics and didn't even believe he was alive at first. Right? Thomas, what did Thomas say? Uh, I'm not going to believe unless I stick my hands in his, in his feet and his side. And his, stick my hands in his side and in his wrist. 
What happened? Jesus showed up and said, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. And he said, oh, I believe. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You, you talk in smack. Get over here. Stick your hand here. Come on, let's do it. The early disciples didn't believe. They all went back and went fishing. They didn't know what to do. Jesus showed up on the shore and says, what are you guys doing? Peter says, I denied you. And he says, uh, do you love me, Peter, more than these? Do you love me, Peter, more than these? Do you love me, Peter, more than these? He asked it three times. Why would he do that? Because Peter denied him three times. These stories were people who were skeptics and they didn't believe until Jesus showed up and proved it. The fourth is Jesus predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection. He said it was going to happen. He called it, and it happened. If you can call that, come on, anybody can call. I'm going to die this Friday, and next Sunday I'll be alive. I'll listen to what you got to say. All right? Uh, number five, the Christian message from the beginning is Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. That's Christian message from the earliest days. Even secular authors, even people who did not believe the Christians all agree that the Christian message was Jesus is alive. All of them do. That's, they believe, you know, they, they may have disagreed with them, but they all said that's the message. So this was the message from the beginning. How about this? Christians died instead of denying their experience with the resurrection. Now, I, I was talking to a group of teenagers this week, and I'll say it again. If, if you're lying about something, and a group of you get in trouble and you're lying about it, if you get enough pressure put on you, somebody's going to roll, right? Yep. Am I correct? Those of us that have had that happen, say amen. 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 All right. So if you put enough pressure, somebody will roll. Do you know how many of the disciples changed their story after the resurrection? How many of the disciples? How many? Say it with me. How many of them? None of them. The story remains the same. We saw Jesus alive. Oh, by the way, out of those 500, how many of them changed their story? None. How many of those 11 disciples died for their faith? All except for one. And he was simply boiled in hot oil and then exiled to an island. But other than that, his life was easy. What am I saying is these people, because people, listen, I know there are Muslims blowing themselves up all over the world. People will die for a lie if they think it is a truth. But nobody will die for a lie that they know is a lie. And all of these people that said they saw Jesus alive all went to their grave, most of them violently, because they believed what they saw was a reality. And by the way, why should they be afraid to die if they saw Jesus get up out of the grave and conquer death, hell, and the grave, walk through walls, and stick your finger in his hands? Why should they be afraid? There is no reason for fear. Are y'all following me here? All right, where am I at? It was, I'm on number seven. Previous opponents became believers. Of course, there's guys like Paul, but my two favorite opponents that became, previous opponents that became believers in Jesus are guys named James and Jude. Does anybody know who James and Jude was? They were the half-brothers of Jesus. Anybody in the room have a brother? Raise your hand. What would it take to make you think your brother was God? Their brothers, who said he was crazy a couple of months earlier, are now calling him God and writing letters defending his resurrection because it says in James or in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus went and appeared directly to James. And from that moment on, James was no longer opponent, but he was the biggest leader of the movement. Something happened to him to change him. All right. How about this one? Uh, number eight, there must be an explanation for the Christian movement survival and explosion. Do you know that Christianity, you would think you kill the leader of Christianity, it's going to die, right? But within a matter of weeks, Peter is standing up looking at the people who killed Jesus and said, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we're witnesses of it. What you going to do about that, bro? Do you hear the attitude? The attitude is we know we have a conqueror and, 
And there, that's the only explanation. Without that, how many little, little cult group leaders have started and the leader gets killed and they just disband? Come on. Everywhere. You know, you get rid of the big leader and the whole thing falls apart. But Jesus dies and it actually grows and takes over the entire world. And then number nine, the testimony of life changed from those who believed. My favorite testimony, because people have given their life for the cause, they have experienced Jesus. Not just the story, but they've experienced it. My favorite one is that priest in, in like a 250 AD who was be, undergoing persecution. And they told him, if you don't recant your belief in the resurrection, we're going to burn you at the stake. And he said, I don't recant. I believe Jesus died for me and is resurrected and alive. So they tied him to a spit over a fire. And they built a fire and they laid him face down over the spit. And as he's laying there and the flames start getting higher and higher and higher and starts eating at his stomach and burning him up and he's beginning to smell his own flesh singe, they said to him, any last words? Expecting him to cry out for help or mercy. And he said, hey, you can turn me over now. I think I'm done on this side. I love that. Do you know why I love that? Because somebody who knows the power of the resurrection does not fear even death. And I know people in this room that when you walk through the doors for the first time, you were dead. Your life was a mess. Your divorce papers were signed. Your family couldn't stand you. You were addicted to drugs and alcohol. Your world was a mess. And you've met a resurrected Jesus, and your life has forever changed. So you're part of the reason I believe in a resurrected Jesus. And last of all, and I'm going to be very transparent about this, I want Jesus to be alive. I want this resurrection story to be true. You know, I'm being honest. Do you know why I want it? Because if... Because if I'm an evolutionist, a secular evolutionist, and I believe that we are all random acts of a random happening of this world, and I won't, I'll talk about all that maybe later this year. But if I really believe that we're just random acts of a random world and that we have no say and we have no purpose and we have no value, if I really believe that and I were to believe that, I would be really suicidal today because there's no reason for us to even be alive. But if Jesus Christ is God Almighty, and he conquered every sin. He conquered every problem this world faces. If he conquered death, and there is an eternity waiting for me if I follow him, then I not only have a reason to live today, I have a reason to live tomorrow too. And because he lives, all fear is gone. I know I can face tomorrow because he lives. I want it to be true. I don't want to just live my life and just wake up in the morning and go through the motions and then one day retire and then get old and crotchety and then die. I don't want that. I want to grow ever brighter until the full light of day like the path of righteous so that I wake up tomorrow with more hope than I had today. And the day after that, I have more hope and I lead more people to hope and we have more life. And one day when I die, we're going to celebrate that because I serve the King of Kings who has conquered conquered death, hell, and the grave, and that will be my joy. All right, one last thing, one last thing, and, and I know they're up here, and I, I got one more story. Will y'all give me one more story? All right, one more story. So I was walking along the beach the other day, and I looked down, and uh, there was a fish that had flopped up on the beach. He was laying there on the beach, you know. He's laying there, and I thought to myself, you know, this fish needs life. This fish is, it's struggling for life. So you know what I did? I took a couple of real good pictures of it, post them on Facebook and Instagram. You know why? Because likes give you life, right? He, he didn't seem quite fulfilled enough by my Instagram post. So I brought him a, I brought him a couple of, play fishes with nice tails. And we threw a little party, gave him dollar dollar bills, y'all, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> threw him a party right there on the beach with a few dollar dollar bills and a few fish tail, a fish tail magazine. And they were dancing and they were dying too, but that's all right. So there, him and his little girl cadre of fishes were laying around going, I thought, you know what they need? They need margaritas. 
beach without margaritas. And so I gave him some margaritas and, you know, he just lay there. I'm like, dude, you've got everything. I, I, so I went and I bought him a new car, a new house, got him more stuff. Gave him, took a picture then on his perfect beach vacation with all his fishtail girls. And all of that stuff, you know what he was doing the whole time? What was my fish doing the whole time? Dying. You know why? He wasn't in the water. He didn't need all the stuff. You know what he needed? Water. So this morning, there are many of you in this room, you've been living your entire life facing, chasing all the stuff I described. You think that likes on social media is going to make you feel important or the car you drive or the house you live in or the girl that you have or the food you eat or the things you drink or the parties you have or the dollar dollar bills or whatever it is you think no matter what you think that's going to fulfill you. But you know what? None of it will. You're going to lay there and just die. You're just going to lay there and die. Do you know what you really need? You need to get into the water of the life of Jesus Christ. He offered you eternal life. So I'm going to ask you this morning, would you just bow your heads with me real quick? And I want to ask you a very simple question, all right? If you're in this room right now and Jesus is talking to you, it's not me. I'm not talking you into anything. The Holy Spirit is talking to you. He's grabbing your heart. He's pulling you. He's tugging you. He's saying, hey, I love you. I have a plan for your life. It's better than the plan you're living. I have a way for your life. It's better than what you're chasing. I am real. I am alive. I prophesied it. I fulfilled it. And I also prophesied I have a plan for you. Let me fulfill that for you. If you're in this room and you are not in relationship with Jesus, I want to pick you up and put you in the water right now. You know how we're going to pick you up and put you in the water of God's love? I'm going to ask you if you say, I want to believe in Jesus Christ. Lift your hand real high. I want to pray with you right now. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to live for him right now. Lift your hand up. Yes, yes, yes. All around this room, hands are going up. Leave them up. I want want to see them. I want to be able to pray with you. Yes, around this room, there are hands up. Can we all pray together? Everybody at the same time. Can we do this together? All right, everybody. Nobody prays alone. Dear Jesus. I believe in you. I believe in you. I trust you. I I give you my life. I I know you have not forsaken me. You have a plan. Let me step into that plan. Let me step into your forgiveness. Let me step into your purpose. I receive it. You now have my life. I give it to you. Now give me yours. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I told a boy this past week, he was a a tough street kid. I was playing basketball with him and shared Jesus with him, and the guy gave his heart to Christ, and he said to me, I asked Jesus to be the boss of me today. I loved it. It was so cool. I was like, yeah. Little ninth grade young man, tough kid. Played basketball with him. He's a tough kid. I asked Jesus to be the boss of me. And you know what I told him? I said, if you really prayed that prayer and you meant it, you're going to be really, really bad at sinning from now on. You're going to be really bad at doing things the old way from now on. You know why? Because God believes you and took you at your word. And if this morning you asked Jesus to be your Lord and to give you his life, he took you at your word. Do you understand that? He took you at your word. And he's given you all of his blessings. And he's not going to let you be the old you anymore. So come back next Sunday. Let's hang out. Let's learn God's word. Let's get in a life group. Get in a life group. We got life groups starting back up. All right. We're going to, I could, I'm getting fired up. Let's go. Would y'all stand up? Let's get out of here. All right. Would you hang around for three minutes and sing this song with them? You guys got a good one? Would we do that? All right, let's do that. May the Lord Jesus bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. Amen. God bless you. Happy Easter all.